Yes, that is probably, if anybody said what should we say about you, I honestly say I'm Erin's mom. That's probably my favorite title ever. Um, so uh, what a hard presentation to follow. That was amazing. It gave me so much to think about. And I just have to, before I start, um, I'm doing a, a small workshop um, this afternoon on child-adult relationship enhancement. And we think it's fantastic. We think it has lots of places for implementation. Um, we don't even have a website, so we won't even go there. If any of you know how to create one, that'd be awesome. But anyway, somehow Sweden found us. And so um, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues and I are headed to Sweden to train folks in this model. Um, and I was fascinated by the resignation syndrome starting in Sweden because they asked us if they could translate the work um, and to train their facilitators in Swedish, Arabic, and Somali. And we were like, why? Why those? I mean, Sweden, I have this image of tall blonde people, um, and Arabic and Somali, and then as we talked, the number of refugees that that country has taken in um, from uh, that are Arabic speaking and um, Somali. So anyway, I, I really appreciate it. Now I understand why they're translating into that. So my, my goal today, and I'm going to talk super fast because John said I'll give you about an hour, and I thought, yeah, and if you saw how many slides I have, I have to talk fast, which is... Great, um, I have this beautiful boot on. Um, so they said, do you move around? And I said, usually, but I will probably fall off. So I'm gonna stay put. Um, I wanna spend uh, my time today talking about how do we understand and respond to children that have experienced a traumatic event. Um, I think this is so true. In a moment, in a heartbeat, everything changes. I did not start out as a psychologist planning to do any work related to children and large-scale disasters and traumatic events. Um, uh, I am a parent-child interaction PCIT uh, master trainer, and my area of focus really was on um, working related to PCIT, little kids with bad behaviors. And I was in Oklahoma City, and this happened. 25 years in April. It is mind-blowing to me that it was 25 years ago because it sometimes seems like it was yesterday. And I joke sometimes, um, because I really focus on young children, I was the uh, Oklahoma Office of Child Care and the Oklahoma Departments of Ed a consultant on managing very young children with challenges in preschools and childcare and elementary schools. When Oklahoma City happened, they called. I think, I know some of you I'm looking around are so young you won't know what a Rolodex is, but I swear that was the only name they had and they called and I felt like something from Gone with the Wind, but Miss Scarlett, I don't know nothing about trauma. I, it was so, so foreign to me, and um, I reached out to a few folks that had done some of this work um, around the world or after natural disasters, and um, hi, I am Robin Gerwich. I'm a psychologist in Oklahoma City, and every single one said, what can I do? And now I am very honored to say these have become very close and personal friends. Um, I became a Red Cross volunteer on April 19th. Um, and continue to do work with the American Red Cross. Um, and uh, began collaborating with uh, Dr. Betty Fesferbaum and others in Oklahoma City to begin to find out what happens to children after these kind of events. Um, and now I continue to do that work. I, I will tell you personally, um, I have missed two anniversaries. I'm not in Oklahoma anymore, obviously. I'm at Duke. Um, I go back every year. I volunteer my time there because I think 
when, when communities have experienced such devastating events, if there's any way we can continue to help, it would be great. It's 25 years, but I will tell you, I was there a couple years ago. They are still opening cases for individuals that are experiencing pretty continual distress. And somebody told them, um, those are normal reactions to an abnormal event. We all hear that. They didn't know that meant that it was supposed to get better. Uh, because it was normal. So uh, I think we need to change those words just a little bit. When we think about trauma, I'll share with you SAMHSA's definition. Um, individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by the individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. Um, and has long-lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So again, really thinking through how that event is experienced in, in my talk today by a child. Um, we know there are so many events um, in a child's life that can be considered trauma. Um, I'm sure you probably could come up with many more, but that's what could fit on a slide, which is frightening in and of itself. There have been um, events in Florida. I mean, you have hurricanes. Um, unfortunately, the school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, um, the recent shooting at the Pensacola Air Station, um, I saw the bridge collapse in right near here, I think. It was right south. You can see I'm not from here. I say I grew up not too far away. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Um, and then Pulse Nightclub. So, again, I look out. And I realize that when I say this next thing, some of you are going to whisper to each other, I wasn't born yet, or I was still in diapers. But um, years ago, there was this idea that if children experienced a trauma, we didn't need to worry, didn't need to do anything, because any reactions they had were going to be pretty mild. They were going to go away. So why would we need an intervention? It wasn't until the early 1980s, to me that doesn't seem so long ago as a proud card-carrying AARP member. <laughs> um, but that's crazy to me. Why? Because until the early 80s, something happened in the, in the early 80s. Dr. Bob Pinus, who actually is one of the uh, co-directors of the NCTSN, did something no one had ever done before. There was a school shooting out in California on an elementary school playground. And he did something that no one had done before. He talked to the children. Can you believe that? Until the 1980s, if there was a disaster, you talked to teachers, you talked to parents, you talked to lot caregivers. Nobody talked to a child. That was crazy. And Bob did. And guess what? Their reactions were not mild. They didn't just go away. And you know what? We needed to do something about it. So the field of um, child mental health, particularly it relates to trauma, is um, still, I think, making giant leaps, but still very much in its infancy compared to other things. I mean, PTSD for kids? didn't even come into the DSM until the 80s. So we really have to think about where we are and where we're going. I still think the DSM doesn't do a great job on kids, but that's my own personal opinion. Um, and so we need to think about how do we understand trauma through the eyes of a child? Um, what does it mean? And to recognize that um, traumas can be single events, they can be chronic events, they can be complex. Um, neglect, yes, counts as a trauma, particularly for young children whose needs are met by caregivers. And as much as we would like to wrap our arms around children and keep bad things from happening to them, um, they happen. And from our last speaker, we certainly see some of the ways that we treat people who have been through trauma. I'm going to just bombard you with a few numbers. Um, 
we recognize that children are exposed to, to violence in um, horrific numbers uh, regularly. We know that children can die from abuse and neglect every year. Um, we know that child maltreatment is significantly underreported. So if these are the numbers for what gets reported, imagine the numbers when we take into account all of those cases. And if some of you work in the field, how many of you have had cases where you know you would bet your license on it, but because of whatever happens, it's not adjudicated, so it didn't happen? What does that say to the child? Are we re-traumatizing a child by saying, yes, you told, but the system doesn't work? We also have to recognize the impact of substance use now um, and the numbers of children that are living in homes where one, at least one caregiver is using substances. It is tough being a parent. It is harder being a parent if I am wasted. Um, and I don't want to discount the impact of grief and loss on children. Um, so to recognize that children often experience um, the death of a friend or a close, a close friend or a family member before they ever get out of high school. And how do we do that? Um, we know that um, PTSD is, is huge when we actually study it, particularly for children that are in our foster care system. You know, let's face it, you don't say, you know what, life has been so good for me, I think I'm gonna try foster care. That's not why you go into foster care. Something happened to you that necessitated that the people that were supposed to take care of you cannot any longer provide for you and take care of you. So we need to recognize that there are so many, many children out there that experience trauma on a regular basis. And children don't come in to, to you or to schools or you see them and they have a placard that says, my mom and dad beat the crap out of each other last night while they were drunk and um, I have to take care of three siblings and my dog just died last week. And they don't wear that. So you don't know because we don't see it. And rarely will a caregiver call school and tell them this is what's going on so Johnny may have a rough day today in class. So I want everybody to stand up. Because if you can't, if you don't move to this, then, there, then that's a whole other issue. All right, you can move, it's okay. And you know what? She got it wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> the more traumas you have, doesn't make you stronger. The more traumas you have puts you at higher risk for problems. That's the song we need. We need to make sure that we understand that. And I know that probably everybody in this room has heard about the ACEs, so I'm gonna be real, real fast and save time flipping through it. When this was first out, it was groundbreaking. You know, they took you know, 17,000 adults and asked them, what happened to you in childhood? And the only thing on here that would not be considered by SAMHSA's definition a true trauma is divorce. But they asked 17,000 people that were employed by Kaiser Permanente. So what did that mean? Had a job and I have insurance. So those 17,000 that participated, that was great. But they all, had wor they all worked and had insurance. And why did this study start? Honestly, this study started because the insurance company was looking about how do we save money and what's going on. Um, and so they found incredible things that will spend a little bit of time, but as we're learning more and more about those adverse childhood experiences, yeah, that may be the leaves on the tree, those 10 events. There's a lot of things that feed that tree that we need to be aware of. We need to think about poverty, discrimination, racism, violence, um, opportunities, poor, 
poor housing, um, so many other things that are underground that feed that tree where the adverse events then take place. We know that adverse events are not rare. Just because you've had one, you may say, gosh, I could check all 10 boxes. Doesn't say, okay, this is your outcome. It just puts you at risk. We'll talk about protective factors too. But at least 64% of the respondents said, yeah, I've at least had one. We know from the ACEs that if there are ACEs, increased risk for suicide attempts, increased risk for early sexual intercourse under the age of 15. What they didn't say is probably some of those 15-year-olds or under got pregnant. So then you have a whole other generation too. Um, increased risk for substance abuse. And then all the things that put the ACEs on the map is these issues that happen to you as a child are also related to cancer or heart disease as well as other mental health problems. And four tends to be the tipping point. So to look at it another way, I mean, these are crazy stats, right? You are 1,133% more likely to use injected drugs if you've had four more ACEs. That's incredible. That's, that's something we need to really look at, these numbers from the ACEs. I heard one of the authors of this uh, study speak one time, and they said, well, you know, Dr. Folletti, that's all well and good, but what about that, that four or more um, and all your wonderful findings, but what about people that live in violent neighborhoods, that are, um, are poor, that are unemployed, that have no insurance, that are, that are more likely to be minorities and all the things that that holds? What about them? Your study didn't look at them. And his response was, we didn't need to do that study. We already know they're starting with four or more ACEs. Um, and it really made us pause and think about that. ACEs are also extremely um, costly. Violence is extremely costly. And I don't know, maybe that will be one way that we change things if we can put it into numbers that the decision makers sometimes seem to understand best. While we think about um, PTSD, I think it's also important to remember that's not the only things that happen with trauma. There are lots of other things. We talked about bereavement and loss. Um, but there are also secondary losses. If I move to a new location, maybe I go have to go live with my grandparent, but my grandparent lives in Nebraska, and I grew up in Miami. New school, new friends, new teachers, new everything. What's that like for the child? Um, what happens? What are some of the other risks for that child? And we also know that there is huge mental health disparity. Um, we know that a, a little over a quarter of our children have mental health problems, but over half of them don't get help. Um, I am sad to report that Florida ranks 44th in need versus access, but you're all here. So it's going to change, right? We hope it will. I didn't even look where Alabama was. We used to say when I was growing up, well, if it wasn't for Mississippi. <laughs> I know. If anybody's here from Mississippi, I apologize. <laughs> if we think about the impact of trauma on children, we know it affects them, and we need to understand how it affects them academically their feelings and emotions, communication, and if they had pre-existing conditions, piling on doesn't make it, make it better. Those children are more at risk. So let's take those apart a little at a time. If we think about learning, if we think about learning, we know that if children have been exposed to trauma, it reduces IQ, reading, grade point, absenteeism, um, high school graduation, and higher rates of expulsion and suspensions. Anybody know who gets suspended and expelled most? Kindergartners. Really? Maybe it's because they don't have to go to kindergarten, but that's the greatest number of children in this country that are expelled 
um, or suspended, our children, our, our kindergarteners. So, um, and it's usually looking at reasons across the board for suspension and expulsions. It seems to be not as much related to behavior as it is related to perceived attitude of the student. Just an, anyway, I won't go there. I don't have enough time for that talk right now. But to think about how many triggers. We all talk about recognizing that children may be triggered at any time. But if my parents were killed in, a, in an accident, and I'm reading a book in English class in which a character dies in an accident, and then I am not attending to class that day, do I tell the teacher why? Do I even understand what's happening to me? Um, listening to more information on the news. I, I got a call yesterday um, uh, from a colleague of mine that heads up the suicide services for the state of Oklahoma. Um, there was a group of um, cross-country runners, I think athletes of some kind, that were running on the sidewalk and a car purposefully um, came and basically plowed them over. Um, several students died, um, others in the hospital. And um, she called, she said, and this man, when they are started to look, and I haven't checked the news to make sure if it's real or not, but they think that his son had been killed in an accident the day before, and so perhaps it was just, I'm seeing healthy people that are similar to my son, and I can't handle that. Anyway, lots of children grieving, but she called, not so much because of what just happened, but because a month before that high school had experienced the death of a very popular student. And so now she's like, what's going to happen? I said, Julie, you really need to make sure that all your information around suicide gets out there, right? But we know there's lots of triggers that happen to kids all the time. And when we think about reactions, they, they fall into different categories. Um, how many of you are parents, aunts, uncles, have kids in your life? Just raise your hand. Okay, so keep your hand up if you received a manual on how to, right? The scariest day of my whole life was when they handed me my daughter and said, good luck. I was like, what? I looked all over her. Do you know if you, I mean, if you think about it, we have to have a license to drive. We have to have a license to fish, to hunt, to own a gun. We have to have licenses for lots of things. I have no parenting license. My daughter succeeded in spite of that. Um, we think about, too, that it doesn't matter if you buy washers and dryers or Legos or a butterball turkey. There is a 1-800 number to call to exchange or to ask questions and to exchange defective parts. <laughs> I will tell you that around 12 and a half, I looked all over for her 800 number, right? We don't know, so I can't turn to chapter five on what can I do to understand what's happening to my child who's just been through a traumatic event. So we have to support that because oftentimes people are trying the very best they can without a lot of information. Worries and fears are tremendous because depending on the age, because it really does change with age, when I'm little my worry and fear are about me and the people important to me, because the world is about me. As children get older and they understand more and empathy becomes part, hopefully, of who they are, the worries grow. And so my sphere of worry and anxiety grow. So I'm really pleased to see that um, there's a speaker um, later in this conference talking about anxiety, because that's a huge issue, particularly after any kind of trauma and disaster. Um, worried about whether this is going to be an event that happens again. Worries about ongoing situations. The first time there was um, a school shooting, we offered to provide workshops to other schools on how you can prepare. And you know what we were told? It won't happen here. We don't need that. Right? You know all too well that we don't get to pick 
and we can't, we can't predict when and where things are going to happen. We also know that with, with worry also comes guilt and shame. And that's for all kids, no matter what their age. They worry about what they did or what they didn't do. They worry about their relationship with someone that's died or was hurt. And they worry about their own feelings about what happened. I was working after um, Hurricane Katrina and um, was talking to a family with a five-year-old who felt incredible guilt because he felt like his parents had to flee. Grandmother was in the hospital because of some health issues um, when they arrived to their new location. He felt terrible because he had not gotten all the insurance paperwork and medication lists and everything else. He's five. He wasn't, he didn't have that information anyway, but he felt incredible guilt that he should have been able to do something and to know something. All right, so when you look at this, kids are hyperactive, kids are inattentive, kids are having mood swings, they're not getting along with their peers well, they have poor organizational skills, they have outbursts all the time. In most instances, what have I just described? A child with what? ADHD. And we have been well conditioned by the pharmaceutical industry. If your child has any of these things, call, um, call us and we'll provide free samples of Adderall, Stratera, Ritalin, whatever. And if you can't afford them, don't worry because AstraZeneca is here to help. <laughs> the problem is all of those same symptoms are reactions to children after trauma. And the best treatment for trauma is not medication. And that's come up over and over and over again. And so we really have to recognize that is it trauma? Is it ADHD? I know after Oklahoma City, we had a huge number of kids that were referred for ADHD evals for the first time. High schoolers, middle schoolers, elementary. You don't wake up one day at 15 and all of a sudden you have ADHD. Something else probably happened. So we really have to begin to understand. And then you have that cross section where ADHD and trauma go to overlap. So now you're probably thinking, how are you going to work in pandas into this talk on trauma? <laughs> well, I'll tell you how. So, when the um, earthquake happened in 2008 in western China, there were almost 100,000 killed in that earthquake. Most of those were children. But the epicenter of that earthquake was the panda preserve. And the pandas were up in the tree, and they had to bring the pandas down because they were crying and distressed. And they took these pandas who had been living together in this preserve, and they put them in separate cages, and they sent the pandas all over China to stay while they rebuilt the preserve. Okay? So... While we were working in China, uh, first of all, they told us for $600 you could hold a panda, a baby panda. And there were 10 of us, so we thought, we'll pony up 60 bucks to hold a panda. When would we ever get that chance again? 600 for you, 600 for you, 600 for you. We didn't hold a baby panda. <laughs> but they gave us a few hours off, and the panda preserve had just reopened, so we went. And we saw these three pandas playing. They seemed to be having fun. And then we saw the two bigger pandas push the little one down a ravine. And the little panda, and then they would go over and talk or do whatever. And the little panda would try to make its way to the top of the ravine. And he would get almost to the top, and they would rush over and shove him back to the bottom. I desperately wanted to go find somebody to stop the bullying. <laughs> so my pandas are to remind us that after trauma, we are likely to see an increase in bullying behavior. 
increase in bullying to children that were never bullied before, and an increase in bullying by children who had never bullied before. And we need to be aware of that because bullying has its own whole set of issues. We know there are physiological responses. Our bodies respond to trauma too. So when I'm in class and maybe I'm at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and a siren passes by and my body reacts, I'm not listening to what the teacher said. And so now I've missed what she said and now I'm seen as not having paid attention and I need to get back, get my head in the game. Not recognizing that my body just had a massive reaction to the siren. Joplin, Missouri, after the, after the devastating tornadoes that wiped out most of the schools there, what do you think the weather was the first day back to school? Yeah. Horrible thunderstorms and rain. Was anybody paying attention? I'm still trying to figure out what geometry does for my life, but I probably really wouldn't have been paying attention in geometry that day. So we have to recognize that our bodies react to trauma too, and it's hard to just shut off. We also recognize that oftentimes children, particularly young children, respond with headaches, stomach aches, vague aches and pains. I'm working right now um, with the um, school district in the um, Northern Mariana Islands, um, which is a U.S. territory in the middle of nowhere. Like, here's Japan, here's Australia, and there's Saipan right in the middle of the ocean. And they get hit regularly with um, cyclones. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about is what can the schools, what should they look at, what should they measure. I said talk to your school nurses, look for absenteeism, look for children that are having school failure for the first time, all the things that schools create that we need to make sure we're looking at. You know, sometimes people ask me, how are the children doing? How did they do in the aftermath of Oklahoma City? Now that happened in 1995. We had to beg, beg the Institutional Review Board to allow us to screen children under third grade. And they said absolutely not because one of the members of the review board sent everything, took everything home and had her second grader fill it out and asked him what he thought about it. He said, I was bored, I didn't like it. Of course, it didn't follow what we did, what we were proposing to do, but that was the reason why you couldn't screen anybody under second grade. Thank God we weren't trying medication. Um, so I don't know what, how they were doing as a group. That was one of the lessons we passed forward after 9-11, is making sure that we know that it's not a one snapshot, but we continue to look over time and to recognize that children, little children, may talk about it incessantly, which if adults are stressed, is really problematic. Older children may not talk about it much at all. I think one of the best questions to ask teens is tell me what you know about fill in the blank. They still may not tell you much, or how are you doing? They're gonna say, eh. Ask them how their friends are doing. Ask them what their friends are talking about. Because I'll tell you about my friends more than I'll tell you about me. And we have our friends. Why? Because they're like us. So if you can tell me how your friends are doing after the shooting, I'm probably giving you a little bit of insight of how I'm doing and what my worries are. We know there are changes in spirituality, too. Um, we don't see this really in young children. We see this more in, as kids get older. The good news is... We also know what kinds of things might make a difference. We still know that if you were um, directly exposed or had someone directly exposed, um, you're more at risk. Many other issues on that as well. I love the last speaker, thank you very much, talking about, excuse me, parental adjustment. If we don't make sure families are doing well, then how do families help children? Um, how were they doing the day before it happened? Uh, and the world has become a 24-7 news cycle that children are exposed to. 
via watching it themselves, hearing about it through adult conversations. My children don't know they were just playing a game in the room while I was watching the TV. No, that doesn't happen. Um, uh, or on any kind of electronic device that I can find out about this, or even on the school bus. I talked to somebody recently about um, anxiety and coronavirus in children, or anxiety in children about the coronavirus. Um, grammar matters. Um, so um, she said, well, you know, I asked her, did she have children? And she said, yes, but um, her son was six years old and he doesn't know anything about it. I said, does he ride the school bus? Yes. Um, anybody on the school bus have brothers and sisters that are over six? Anybody on the school bus maybe talking about it? I never thought about that he might hear it from someone else. It's like our world is really small. And, and John Comer has done some of the seminal research on the importance of families to talk to their children after a horrific event has occurred. Because we can't do this anymore. We really can't. As hard as it is, we need to know what's going on and what's happening with our children, and we need to understand what's happening with social media as well. So, so a little overwhelming, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go back to bed and put the blanket over my head. The good news is the majority of children after traumatic events are actually pretty resilient. I've loved the discussion of strengths really important. Most children are not going to develop significant mental health concerns. But just because that the most of the kids aren't going to have problems, does that mean we don't do something? Because even children that are wonderfully resilient and have incredible strengths, we still need to support them. We still need to help them and to recognize that I may be pretty strong and resilient in situation A, that doesn't necessarily mean if situation B happens, I'm going to be able to be resilient in that situation. So while most are, to say, well, we don't really need to do anything because most of you are going to be fine, we'll wait for the 25% that may need help. Those 75% of kids need help too. So we need to make sure that we're providing services across the board at all times. We know there are protective factors for children, and one of the strongest is a family relationship. And families come in all different shapes and sizes, but does that child of any age have adults that they have a close connection to, that they can trust, that they can lean on? And while it would be great if that trusting family relationship were their caregivers, sometimes it's not. Do they have a trusting relationship with a teacher? And I'll tell you, um, we were doing focus groups after 9-11 in uh, D.C. with 7th and 8th graders. And um, one kid talked to us about, um, they saw kids leaving the class. They didn't know what was going on, but they knew something, was, something had happened. Teachers were crying in the hallways. No, everybody said, don't worry about it, everything's fine, except for two teachers, a drama teacher and a science teacher, who said, there's been an attack on this country in New York and now in the Pentagon. Lots of people have died. I don't know any more details. You need to talk to your family. This is what I know now. And 201, the kids in the focus group talked about that if anything were happening or if they needed to go to anybody, the only two people they would go to would be the drama teacher or the science teacher. If you come to me and say something is happening in the school and I say, hey, look, not my job, I'm going to take you to the school counselor, the likelihood of me now going and talking to a school counselor is zero. We need to make sure that we can respond, and then if we can make a, a warm handoff, that's great. But we have to make sure that any adult that comes into the orbit of a child's life can talk to them in a way that the child feels supported so that the adult can help get them help. 
um, the care program that uh, I'm doing for my breakout, um, we have a classroom version where we have trained school janitors and lunch ladies and school bus drivers as well as the school principals and the guidance counselors and the teachers. Because sometimes kids go to the, the resource officer or the janitor or the school bus driver and if they don't know how to respond, then the likelihood that that child's going to reach out to somebody else goes down. So we need to make sure everybody has the same information. We know if kids have good relationships with friends, they do better. And actually, there's some nice research talking about children that are involved in at least one extracurricular activity are less likely to have mental health problems than children that are completely devoid of that. Completely other research on the overscheduled child that can't breathe without having it scheduled for them. You know, there's problems and anxieties and worries that come with that overscheduling and a decrease in being creative and being able to spend time alone because, wait, it didn't tell me what toy to play with at 302. So we need to recognize that there's a balance. Um, uh, social skills and self-esteem. So we're understanding more about the importance of social emotional learning in, in, in schools, in other arenas, in mental health. Um, and just a willingness to ask for help. And again, I'm not going to ask for help if I don't feel connected with at least one adult. So it all comes around. Um, and then we know that um, a protective factor to reduce the likelihood of problems is the lack of the child to substances and the lack of access to guns. And that's, I can say facts, but again, that's a whole nother lecture and I can't go there. I do want to mention this. You know, sometimes the world seems like a pretty mean place, says Calvin. And Hobbes replies, that's why animals are so soft and huggy. Don't underestimate the importance of pets in a child's world. Pets are oftentimes who a child confides in, their most deepest, darkest secrets and their biggest hopes and dreams. When you have to evacuate someplace and I don't know what's going to happen to my pet, that can increase problems significantly. I love the fact that Red Cross has partnered with shelters and the Humane Society to make sure that if people have to go into shelters, there's also places that can take in their animals, right? Um, and adults, too. There were um, that series of, of horrific hurricanes that swept through Florida um, several years ago. It was like one after another after another. There were adults that died because they wouldn't leave because they had nowhere for their animals to go, so they stayed with their animals. So we need to recognize that if a pet is separated from their children um, or if a pet dies in a disaster, don't just say, well, we'll go down and get a new one. Because um, for that child, it means something very, very different, and you can't replace things that quickly because that that relationship is important. So please think about um, pets when you think about that too. Um, a colleague of mine does phenomenal work in the field of child maltreatment and animal abuse. And the intersection between animal abuse and child abuse is very high. So she now recommends asking, do you have pets? Have you ever had a pet just disappear? Do you have pets disappear regularly, or have there ever been a death of a pet? Because she found that if you ask those and the answers are yes, the likelihood that child abuse is happening at home is very high. So, when we think about evidence-based treatments, and I chose some, and I'm sure there are others, but these are the ones that you are most often likely to hear about. Um, when we think about evidence-based treatments for children with a trauma history, um, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, or TFCBT, is probably one of the gold standard treatments for children from about age four or five all the way through high school. Short-term, extremely effective. 
if there's been a disaster or community-wide trauma, one of the things that we, we have often heard is we've got great TFCBT therapists where we are sending them out into the schools. The right after a disaster, you don't need TFCBT, right? Because for most of those kids, they were doing really well before the disaster hit. They need something else. They need psychological first aid. They need other kinds of supportive support. Think of a pyramid with TFCBT at the very top for children that are sig having significant um, distress with what happened. Think of the bottom as the universal, the preventative, and the overall intervention. So I think TFCBT is fantastic, particularly for children who have experienced those single chronic or complex traumas. But when you're talking about disasters and other mass casualty events, yes, some children may absolutely need TFCBT, but that shouldn't be the first thing that you offer in, in the immediate aftermath of an event. How long do you have to have PTSD symptoms before you can even diagnose it? Right, so you need to have it at least four weeks, at least a month. So if I'm running out two days after a, a hurricane hit Florida to say, I'm here for TFCBT, do you have any of these things? The likelihood they're going to say, yes, I'm having problems sleeping. I think about it when I don't want to. My startle response is great. I'm having trouble with my friends. I don't feel as much joy. Oh, gosh, you have PTSD. Quick, I've got TFCBT for you, and it's been three days. So TFCBT is fantastic. And there are TFCBT therapists all over Florida, which is a great thing. There should always be more. Um, but again, um, think about where it comes after the trauma. I told you, full disclosure, um, I could do a whole talk on PCIT. I could talk about it for days and weeks and months on end. I think it is the greatest thing in the entire world for young children with um, significant behavior problems. And oftentimes people say to me, Robin, but PCIT is only for children 2 to 7. And PCIT wasn't developed for trauma. Of course not. PCIT was developed in the 70s, and we didn't even know what trauma was until the 80s. That didn't mean that PCIT wasn't seeing it. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> PCIT has been shown to be extremely effective for young children that have experienced trauma. And sometimes we have found for young children with significant behavior problems that truly would benefit from TFCBT, that the behavior problems are making it difficult to engage in that treatment. So oftentimes children may go through PCAT first, um, and then they may or may not need the next step. PCAT is a cognitive behavioral approach to treating um, significant behaviors. Um, FIU has some of the most recognized, um, world-renowned folks doing PCAT research, Dr. Coma being one. Um, the CDC recently put out some guidance that if you have a young child under the age of six, so five and lower, that if they're presenting with significant behavior concerns, they need to have a cognitive behavioral intervention before you try medication. Yay, right? We did some s detective sleuthing and found out that they realized coming from the CDC they couldn't say get your child in PCIT first before you try meds if they're having these problems. Um, so they went with cognitive behavioral which is what CB, uh, PCIT is based on. It was interesting, I was talking to some folks in Louisiana recently. Um, there's a managed care organization, I think this is just mind-blowing to me, that refused to pay an insurance, refuses to pay insurance claims for medication management 
for children under the age of five unless they can document a six-month trial of CBT first. Right? Wow. Insurance companies thinking about something other than medication. I'm just blown away. But very effective for trauma. Child parent psychotherapy. Um, so PCAT is short term. TF is short term. CPP is, is more long term, um, about 12 to 18 months. But again, for the really littles to help process and help caregivers understand the impact of the trauma on that little one, on that T9C. And so CPP has also been found effective. Cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools, or CBITS, has been shown very effective for high-risk kids. It was first started in um, LA in a school district that had significant uh, community violence. This is for high schoolers, middle schoolers. And they said, no, you're wanting us to take the most high-risk students out of class for an hour for 10 weeks. Those kids need to be in. And they said, just try it. 10 hours over 10 weeks, let's see what happens. And what they found was that those children that were having the most significant problems because of trauma that were out of school or out of class for one hour for services delivered in the schools actually had better grades we're showing less trauma symptoms, less behavior problems, and attitude in classes. So CBT is growing because it's provided in school, so it makes it easier for families that may not be able to come to a clinic. Um, a little plug um, for child adult relationship enhancement. Again, I would direct you to a website if we actually had one. Um, but um, what um, we looked at for care is what about, these are for the, this is the bottom of the pyramid, folks. This is for everybody. If you talk to a child or a teenager at any time, in any capacity, having some skills of how to best do that to create a quickly a supportive, caring, secure relationship and reducing behavior concerns. Um, so there's um, several studies that have come out, which is wonderful um, for us to see that just skills, not therapy, you don't go to care therapy, but are finding pretty significant changes. Everything from changes in behavior problems being reported to um, parents' endorsement of corporal punishment as an appropriate way to discipline, so uh, decrease in that. Um, and uh, improvement in classroom behaviors in some of the toughest high schools around in Chicago. Um, so Calvin and Hobbes really sells it well. Live for the moment is my motto. You never know how long you've got. You could step into the road tomorrow and wham, you get hit by a cement truck. Then you'll be sorry you put off your pleasures. That's why I say live for the moment. What's your motto? <laughs> That's why y'all are here. You're thinking about what's down the road. How can I do something now to make sure that down the road kids are better prepared? How do we support kids down the road? So this came in a fortune cookie recently. The smart thing is to prepare for the unexpected. So, of course, I thought that was a great fortune, so I saved it. Yes, I played these numbers. I'm speaking today, right? So you know the numbers didn't come. Not that I still wouldn't be doing this, but it would be very different. On that note, I am going to stop to make sure that we have time for some questions, because I know this was a big, broad brushstroke over how do we understand kids, but until somebody writes that manual that I can look up what to do after a school shooting, what to do after a hurricane, what to do um, after um, uh, other things for my children, we need to figure out what we can do as those that work with them to better their outcomes. So thank you very much. So I think we have time for a few questions. 
Yes, over here. I actually just have a couple of comments. I saw a story yesterday speaking about animals, and um, it showed a bunch of school-aged children reading in a shelter to, the, to dogs. It's a great story, isn't it? And I can't um, emphasize enough that play, art, music, therapies really, and play therapy really work with children with trauma. So I think all those are good. And the other thing is, just this is for older. I was reading also another article that in college, um, which is a big adjustment for a lot of people, um, there, there are people that have to wait six months to get an appointment when they're thinking um, about suicide, they're depressed, right. they're anxious, and all the pressures that come with college. So I think we need to um, really put pressures on colleges and universities to really up get more counselors, get more crisis counseling, get more suicide intervention. Absolutely. I think one of the best things that's happened is now the new emergency number that you can call for suicide, which is great. That story was fantastic. The other part of that story is after that story broke about the children reading to the animals at the shelter, every animal in that shelter got adopted. Right? Send out the kids to read. Send them out to do all of that. Um, I thought you were going to say when you said to make an appointment for mental health in colleges that bring in therapy animals during exam time because college kids are so stressed and they can sign up to pet and spend 30 minutes with an animal, the lists are filled. They can't get, on, they can't get in to, to do that. But again, how do we make sure that there's enough resources? Y'all are 44th. Next, next time John has this conference, you need to be in, in single digits for um, those that need help and those that can access it. Yes. Hi, good morning. In the absence of like, a, like full training that is not always accessible to a lot of folks, um, what are some resources or things that um, teachers, community members, I think even perhaps parents um, and family members can do when a child maybe discloses having had experienced a traumatic event, um, even as a way to like navigate that conversation to get them additional supports? Great. And I wish I had a one-word answer for that. So, but that's actually why CARE was developed. It was a therapist need derived request for something that anybody could provide to children to, so that they felt supported after something happened. Um, and, and so that's, it's based on multiple therapies, but it's not, so that's part of it. I think the other thing that is so important, again, the suicide hotline is so important because it's training people to be on the other side of the phone to tell, to tell um, individuals what to do. And sadly, we see that it's not just um, older children, teens, that are, that are dying by suicide, but it's young children as well, definitely, um, definitely adults. So I think that's helpful. Um, there are more resources that are being developed. I know, for example, after any um, disaster, so any large-scale event. Um, there are services that are set up by the federal government to create crisis counseling programs, or if it's a man-made like school shootings, there are school grants that are available through Project Serve that allow schools to access services. Um, I would also say in terms of looking for resources, particularly resources that cost nothing, just to educate, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, or nctsn.org, has a plethora, has so many incredible resources from everything from how do you conduct a trauma-informed um, intruder drill, which, again, totally another topic, to um, how to support children after a death, to many other things. So NCTSN has great resources. Often they're in both Spanish and in English. Because I think we forget that um, we need to be culturally sensitive. Um, we probably need to have many more languages just than English and Spanish. Um, but also to recognize there's a huge impact of um, institutional and historical racism and bias that we need to incorporate into all the services that we do. Um, 
because it becomes very difficult to help. Um, I'm going to help give you the, the, the services to get you moving forward, but I started six steps behind everybody else. So how do we help and, and bring that to the fore? Yes. I have two things. UM was having, UM was having a CPIT um, free. They, they had a program, so calling UM also. I don't know if I, FIU does. And the other one is for teens that have a cell phone, there's crisis text line, and that's 741741. They text home to that, and it's um, 24 hours online texting only um, counseling services. Yes, there are so many, and I think that's beneficial. If you know of resources in your communities that are free and available, I think think about how you get those out. Think about getting them to your primary care providers. Think about getting them into your faith and culture-based groups. Those are areas where lots of people go for first help, um, and if there's something that I can give you, then that helps um, increase the likelihood of uptake of those services. And John's there, so that must mean I am the only thing standing between you and lunch? Nope. Nope. Don't no, don't get up. I'm wrong. We've got better than lunch. We have Dr. Michael Southern. Oh, um, right, because it's only 1125. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you.